Dr. Craig, a couple of your colleagues at Biola had a chance to interview Nancy Piercy on their podcast, Shaw McDowell and Scott Ray. Um, you know Nancy. Uh, Nancy is one of my colleagues at Houston Baptist University. She's written a new book called Love Thy Body, and that should get your attention. And in fact, it's getting a lot of people's attention. Yes, it's a provocative title. She um, says a lot in this interview. Let's see if we can condense it down and kind of get to the meat of what she's talking about. Uh, I, I like the beginning of this interview where she talks about as a young person, she wanted solid answers for why Christianity was true. And she decries the fact that some of her professors and teachers just said, hey, it works for me. And they didn't give her the answers that she needed. And so quite on her own, Bill, she began to study the foundations, the intellectual foundations for the faith and became involved in poly apologetics. Mm -hmm. Francis Schaeffer had a, a, a real impact on her. Uh, cultural apologetics, I think, is what Nancy really uh, excels in. And uh, how would you des describe that? I mean, uh, well, as I look at the uh, contents of this book, it would be about what I might call sexual apologetics. Hmm. That is to say, a defense of a Christian view of human sexuality um, and the body. And I do agree with her that this is a vital uh, part of Christian apologetics. It's not one that I myself am engaged in. Uh, she points out in the interview that people are no longer asking the question, is Christianity true? Which she earlier said was the question she as a young person asked. How do I know Christianity is true? That's the question that reasonable faith is dedicated to answering or mm -hmm. helping people to discover an answer to. But she says people aren't asking, is Christianity true? They're asking, why are Christians such bigots? <laughs> and for me, while that's an important question, it's not the most important question. The most important question is and always will be, is Christianity true? And so the focus of our ministry has been on that question, the truth question, because I want to leave behind a legacy of work in the way that Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and William Paley did um, that will be timeless in its um, utility and, and application. But having said that, I'm really glad that someone else, at least, is working on these sorts of questions. Absolutely. I came to the same conclusion that Nancy did, Bill, when I was preparing for these podcasts. When I'm looking around Facebook, and I'm looking at certain blogs and everything, and people who interact with reasonable faith, <laughs> this is what they want to know. I mean, this mm -hmm. is the hot issue right now, transgenderism. And she says the same thing here. Sean says, uh, tell us why you wrote the book, Love Thy Body. And she says, well, it certainly covers the topics that are on the front burner today. Uh, they are the watershed moral issues of our day. The book is about abortion, assisted suicide, homosexuality, transgenderism, and so on. And these are the headline issues. I find that more people want to know answers to those questions than just about any other. And she says, you know, um, uh, just what you said, Bill, earlier, that people aren't, aren't asking, is, is Christianity true? They're asking, why are Christians such bigots? That's sad because... Um, Bill, that uh, means that you can win the culture war if you get control of the vocabulary, in a sense. It's like the fallacy of the complex question. Uh, mm. have, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You know, uh, why is Christianity bigoted? Why are you a bigot? Not is it true? And so it's almost like we have to back up and do two things, show that it's not bigoted, uh, and number two, that it is true, right. isn't it? You know. So she says, what I do and love thy body, the heart of it is, we, we tend to deal with these is issues individually, like uh, assisted suicide and homosexuality and transgenderism and so on, one by one. And you find that we'll be much more effective if we get behind the details of each one, and it turns out that they all share a common underlying worldview. So there's a worldview, she says, Bill, that underlies all of these hot-button issues. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with them? 
Well, you let's go on to see what she identifies as that worldview before I comment. That'll be fine. Um, Scott says, Nancy, give us a sense of how the body has been viewed, so historically in Western culture and then in church as well, because it sounds to me like from reading the book, you're trying to correct a defective view of the body that has really deep roots culturally and in the life of the church. Nancy says, right, it has such deep roots and uh, that I find it's easier if I just start with an example. So you take something like abortion. What most people don't realize is that your view of abortion rests on your view of the body. I would say most bioethicists today most professional bioethicists agree that the fetus is human from conception. The data from DNA and genetics is just too strong to deny it anymore. But what they say is that the fetus is not yet a person until it attains a certain little level of cognitive awareness, cognitive functioning, and so on. Well, what does it mean to be human then? If it's human but not a person, as long as it's just human, it's just a disposable piece of matter. It can be you know, killed, harvested, sellable body parts, and so on. So there it is. When, when we help people recognize that all of secular ethics really rest on a low view of humanity, and so as Christians we are arguing for a much higher view of the value and significance of the value and significance of the human being, of the human body, as we might say. In abortion, the idea is as long as it's still just a body and not a person, it has no value. So I guess that's the underlying worldview there. Yes, and here's where I would tend to disagree with my colleague, Nancy Percy. It seems to me that secular ethics um, is not predicated upon a low view of the body because they identify a human being with his body. They deny typically the existence of the soul. Hmm. And therefore I just am my body. Um, so it's not a low view of the human body. On the contrary, it seems to me that it identifies uh, a human being with his body. Now, by contrast, the Christian, I think, here is in a much more difficult position because I think that the Christian is committed to a form of substance dualism, mm -hmm. which says that there is a soul distinct from the body. And the body derives its moral value from being ensouled. It, it has a human soul, and that's what makes my body morally valuable compared to the body of a chimpanzee or a gorilla. Um, these are not to be treated in the same way because they are not persons. They are not in, in sold. And so the, the Christian, I think, is, in the, is the, actually the one that's in the more difficult position here mm -hmm. because a human body without its soul is just a relatively advanced primate humanoid organism similar to a gorilla or a, ch a chimpanzee. So what would make abortion wrong is that it is, it is killing a body, soul, human being, this composite. Now that would require you to think that the, the fetus is endowed with a soul from conception, that from conception on, we have here a complete person. So where one disagrees with the secularists is not in investing the body with intrinsic value. It's rather in saying that personhood derives from having a human soul rather than developed cognitive awareness. So it's wrong to say that the fetus is a potential person. Rather, it's better to say the fetus is a person with potential. Hmm. The mm. fetus is an ensouled human being with the potential to develop cognitive awareness as, as it develops, and therefore intrinsically valuable and the bearer of human rights. But I think it's a mistake for Nancy to try 
to say that the human body itself is somehow intrinsically morally valuable and that this is where Christians differ from secularists. It's, it's the secularists that are the reductionists and the monists about human beings. They, they identify a human being with his body. And therefore, if they think human beings are valuable, they would think that uh, the body is, is let, me, let me back up and say, okay. and therefore, if they think that human beings are valuable, they would think that the body is valuable. It's an exalted, and I think too high view of, of the body that, that they have. Where they, they differ would be in thinking that the body that is in the fetus is truly human because it hasn't developed cognitive awareness. It may be biologically human, but it's not a human person in their view. Boy, that is tough, Bill, because... These are very difficult questions. Um, for, for one thing, I'm sure that Nancy would agree in that we, what a, a tactic that we often discuss is that if you're going to be in the public forum, if you went on CNN or MSNBC as an interview, you would want to make a so-called secular uh, or a non-religious argument to make your case rather than just punt immediately to right. um, the religious or the, or, the, or the Christian argument. And, and, and this may be what Nancy's trying to do here a little bit is, um, I, I, I'll have to read the book, but uh, that is make an argument that secularists can appreciate because they won't appreciate anything about the soul. If you were going to go on CNN and they ask you about that, <laughs> Bill, yeah. you would have to defend the soul, substance dualism, and then defend the body, you wouldn't have time to do it, Yeah, you know. Well, and it makes it even more difficult for the Christian because if you think that the soul is somehow connected to the body later than conception, then prior to that union, the body would be disposable um, because it wouldn't be a person at that point. But the difference between the human body and a person, I think, is clear and essential that there is a difference between the body and a person. I am not my body. Okay. One quick word here about euthanasia. I never really thought about this, but uh, or assisted suicide and things like that, is that the it's the abortion argument in reverse. The abortion argument says prior to having these cognitive facilities and functions that make us a person uh, so you can kill that thing. Um, euthanasia, assisted suicide, and so on is when one loses those cognitive functions and those things that make one a human, a, a person, then you can destroy that. That's the secular view. That's right. It's the mirror image of abortion. And what yeah. I want to say is that even though the person may have lost some of his capacities, like cognitive awareness, he's still a person mm -hmm. because he is an ensouled human being and, and therefore intrinsically valuable and, and worthy of respect. Yeah. So she says, so, so the upshot is the sheer fact of being biologically human no longer guarantees human rights there. Uh, and that this is a drastic devaluation of what it means to be human. Again, you're commenting there, though, on um, uh, where you disagree. Yes. Uh, where I disagree is that she doesn't seem to want to make this distinction between the person and his body. And that distinction, I think, is vital, and I think it's very clear, too. Um, a human body without a person is just, as I say, like an advanced primate. And what makes us human is that we have human souls. So I think there is a distinction between a person and his body. But I would agree with her that what makes you a person is not cognitive awareness. You can be a person 
who has yet to come to cognitive awareness or who has lost cognitive awareness or who's impaired in his cognitive awareness due to brain damage, for example, but you're still a person and therefore intrinsically valuable. But I think it's a mistake to try to identify our intrinsic value as human beings with our physical bodies. Okay. The next topic that comes up, Scott Ray asks her, uh, does the church have any blame hmm. for taking a low view of the body, theologically? Nancy says, well, I find this a lot with both Christians and secular people. When I say that the secular ethics rest on a low view of the body, their first reaction tends to be, wait a minute, the low view of the body in modern culture is not a product of secularism, it's a product of Christianity. And Nancy says, they have somewhat of a point. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I think there's no doubt that a low view of the, the human body has often been associated with Christianity. And moreover, um, what I've just said implies again that the body is not fundamentally the source of our value as human beings. It, it is from the soul. It's in virtue of being uh, and sold that our bodies have rights that must be respected. So I can sympathize here with the secularist point, um, but it seems to me that on the secularist view, which just identifies a person with his body, they have no basis for affirming human value hmm. or human rights, hmm. because it's just like another animal that's somewhat advanced in its nervous system. Yeah, obviously. A, a complicated electrochemical machine yeah. on a secular view. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good luck defending, I mean, good luck handling that. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this brings up Gnosticism, yeah. Bill, uh, in the church. And uh, I think you can comment on the early Gnostics that viewed anything material or the body as, as evil. And um, uh, But the early church fought against that view. That's they? absolutely right. Uh, think of St. Augustine, who was a Manichae before he became a Christian. And Manichaeans believed that the body is inherently evil, that material is evil, and only the spirit is good. And the church was adamant in rejecting these Gnostic um, and Manichaean views of the body, which thought of the material world as something evil uh, and to be disparaged and, and put aside. And clearly, this is repudiated in Christianity because of the doctrine of the incarnation and resurrection of mm. Christ. God himself takes on a human body in the incarnation, which is an affirmation of its uh, worth and, and, and uh, value. And then he's not content simply to ascend into heaven and leave his body in the tomb. Rather, he raises the body from the dead, invests it with supernatural powers, and takes this glorified physical body into eternity, a permanent affirmation of the wealth of, of, the, of the worth of materiality and its essentiality to the completeness of a human being. We're not just unembodied souls. We are souls intimately united with a body, a human body. Nancy goes on to say that that's why the incarnation was um, kind of scandalous. Uh, it went against uh, Gnosticism and it was foolishness to the Greeks, as Paul put it, that God, the supreme deity, would condescend and take on you know human flesh which was viewed as uh inferior and, and so on so she she does bring out the incarnation mm -hmm. there later on she talks about the resurrection uh, the new heaven and the new earth um finally she says what is the christian teaching about the end of the world it says that god is not going to scrap the material world as though he made a mistake the first time and she appeals here, the new heaven and the new earth, the Apostles' Creed affirms the resurrection of the body. 
Uh, it's not like God said, okay, Satan, you won uh, the physical, I'll, you can have that, and I'll just do the spiritual from now on, but that God is going to redeem both. Um, am I on track there? Right, and I think she's on track. Okay. Um, Sean says, Nancy, you say that to assume the body gives no clue to our identity and to what our sexual choices should be is, quote, profoundly disrespectful. Now, this runs right up against the narrative we have in our culture that our feelings and self-identity should trump the body. Yet you say actually the opposite. Could you explain what you mean by that? And she says, I will. Uh, Really, let me take it again, a specific example. Let's take something like homosexuality. On the one hand, no one really denies on the level of biology, physiology, anatomy, biochemistry. No one denies that males and females are counterparts to one another. That's how the human sexual and reproductive system is designed. When a person engages in same-sex behavior then, implicitly, in, implicitly, they're contradicting that design. They're saying, why should my moral choices be directed by the structure of my body? Why should my body, my identity as male or female, have any voice in my moral choices or what I do sexually? And so the implication is that all that counts really is my mind, feelings, and desires. Uh, Bill, I, I'm seeing the same thing. What, what counts is how you feel about it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have anything to do. Uh, it's basically saying my body is not part of my authentic self. Right. Whereas on the Christian view, we do think of um, human beings as body-soul composites that are intimately united, and therefore your body is important, and you have a specific sex, a male or female, um, and to deny that by homosexual activity or transgenderism, I think she's right is to say that that disrespects the body because more fundamentally it's disrespecting God's design. Yeah. It is God who has made us male and female. Uh, and therefore to disrespect the, the body is to disrespect God who made it. 